Thank you, and uh, you know it's great to be here. And and just to um, set the context, you know we're in a place of incredible historical significance. You think about the innovations that were developed here: the mouse, the GUI interface, uh, networking, and uh, I even heard from our host that 75% of computer scientists in the country were once housed in this building. And you think about <laughs> there weren't a lot of computer scientists back then, or that um, you know, it's very apropos for what we're going to talk about today because I think, as you do, many of us feel like uh, driverless cars, it's not just about taking your hands off the steering wheel, taking your foot off the gas and brake, but it's about something much more transformative, transformative to our lives, transformative to society as a whole. So we're very privileged to have uh, two great guests. Um, these are folks who aren't often out there talking about driverless cars to the public, but because uh, they're MIT alums, um, really wanted to come together for the MIT community. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about their backgrounds. Uh, Alex Padilla is California's Secretary of State, the first ever Latino to hold this position. He is committed to modernizing the voting process, increasing voter registration and participation, and strengthening voting rights. Alex served two terms as a state senator, during which time he led the le legislative effort to regulate the autonomous vehicle industry, which is currently being enforced today as many companies enter the market. Prior to that, he was the youngest ever elected member of the Los Angeles City Council and served three terms as its council president. And uh, I remember um, during 9-11, uh, Alex was also acting mayor of LA during that very tumultuous time and uh, was an incredible leader during that time. Alex received his BS in mechanical engineering from MIT in 1994, uh, and we got a chance to meet when I was a freshman there in 1992. John Kraftchik is the CEO of Waymo, a self-driving technology company with a mission to make it safe and easy to move people and things around. Building on software and sensor technology developed in Google's labs, Waymo was formed in December 2016 under Kraftchik's leadership with the goal to improve transportation for people around the world. John has extensive experience in both the automotive and technology spaces, including broad operating experience in engineering, product development, technology, and manufacturing, with stints at Numi, Ford, Hyundai, and TrueCar. Previously, Mr. Kraftchik spent 10 years in leadership positions at Hyundai Motors America, including five as his president and CEO. And um, if uh, you guys haven't seen Hyundai's amazing product that they had built during his time as president and CEO, Mr. Kraftchik holds an MS in Management Science from the Sloan School of Management, where he wrote two Lean Production Manifestos, Triumph of the Lean Production System and Running the Factory Chapter of the Machine that Changed the World, a very interesting and important book about um, the automotive industry. So with that, uh, let's welcome our keynote speakers and Alex. Well, thank you, Jake. Good evening, everybody. How y'all doing? Good. All right. I can tell uh, both by the size of the crowd and the energy, even before we came into the room, that this is a, maybe a good event. So looking forward to, to the dialogue and the conversation. Uh, first things first, you, you heard a disclaimer about at some point we're not going to be recording, and so that we're completely honest. What did you say? <laughs> Well, I will neither confirm nor deny that they came from my office, but I'll, but I'll take the bullet for them, all right? I'll take it. Uh, <clears throat> the, I wanted to, to kind of set a bit of a context here from, from the perspective that I come to this, because I'm not the engineer, I'm not the R&D guy, I'm not the, the one uh, that's going to bring the autonomous uh, vehicle or driverless car technology to the marketplace. My role is that of policymaker. Uh, so before I get into a little bit of the experience of what it was like, not with, so authoring legislation not, not to, with the purpose of regulating autonomous vehicles, but frankly to create a pathway for the technology to be deployed in California and ultimately the industry to, to grow here in California. Uh, I want to set a context for it because, as you may be surprised to learn, uh, government in general and Cal the California legislature is no exception, is not always the quickest and the best when it comes to keeping up with innovation uh, and understanding uh, emerging technologies and getting their arms around 
policy issues that emanate from innovation uh, as Silicon Valley is. Uh, so if you, if you were to uh, do you know, searches of uh, not just my bio, but some of the legislative history that I have, I mean, in my current capacity as Secretary of State, I can uh, talk your ear off about technology and election administration and security. Uh, if you look at my eight years in the State Senate, you'll see how you know, I, I authored a lot of legislation, even go back to my city council days, where I constantly ask myself, how can we utilize state-of-the-art technology to improve X, right? Whether it's healthcare, whether it's education, whether it's seismic safety, uh, or for today's purposes, transportation. Uh, and keeping up with Technology Review Magazine and Wired and some things other than the New York Times and the Sacramento Bee, it just gave me a ton of ideas of legislation to, to author. Uh, a lot of which actually got to the finish line and signed by governors and helped sort of pave the way. You know, think about six of my eight years in the state senate, I was chair of the Energy Committee, uh, which oversaw energy, utilities, telecommunications. We've seen the advancements of all that. And Im imagine how eyes glazed over in the legislature, the, my first co uh, committee hearing as chair, where I gave a talk about Moore's Law. <laughs> and the rate at which processing speeds improves, and what that means, the potential. Uh, hello, everybody, hello. Uh, and applying that to not just the race for more renewable energy, but things like energy efficiency and electric grid management, right? So as you can imagine, I have found a unique space in the political world as being either a translator or ambassador, right, between the tech community and the innovators, and the policymakers who uh, too few have engineering and science degrees or backgrounds. So I think I found my sweet spot. Right? I think I found my niche. So along the way, and keeping up, keeping up with trade publications, hearing from uh, different research efforts in California, and even on uh, one of my trips to MIT as a member of the corporation for five years, uh, getting updates on what's going on. It, uh, Lincoln Lab in, in the space of driverless cars or potential autonomous vehicles, it, it hit us that, uh, wait a minute, if you look at the California Vehicle Code, driverless cars are neither prohibited nor permitted. So does that mean they're legal? <laughs> or does that mean they're illegal? Well, we don't know. You know, both from, from, from a legal as well as a, a business standpoint, Clarity and certainty are good things. And so the initial idea was, well, let's sponsor legislation that creates the pathway, uh, right? That's, that's the beginning of it, but as legislation goes through its process, you know, you, you, you deal with a lot of issues along the way. Things like, well, are we talking about just going, you know, zero to the finish line, or are we talking about a testing period in between before it's available to consumers? Or what about the liability issues? You know, are we talking about the technology that makes a car autonomous being an aftermarket product, or is it part of coming off the assembly line when it's originally manufactured? Uh, and, and a lot of other things. But I knew the potential, if for no other reason, because of some data. Uh, the vast majority of accidents, the vast majority of injuries and fatalities that come from car crashes are caused by human error. So going back to that fundamental question, if we can use state-of-the-art technology to improve highway safety, in this case, then I feel compelled to do so. And the more we learned about the potential for the technology from a uh, traffic management and congestion standpoint or uh, an emission reduction air quality standpoint uh, or a planning and land use standpoint in cities, we knew that the more we learned, the more upside there was to allowing and stimulating the technology coming to the marketplace. So that's what led me to introduce uh, Senate Bill 1298 back in, I believe it was 2012, so coming up on our fifth year anniversary. Uh, it, it, we can share some war stories in the conversation maybe about the legislative process and you know doing battle in transportation committee hearings and judiciary committee hearings and on the floor of the Senate, but ultimately it was passed on a bipartisan basis uh, and signed by Governor 
Brown. Uh, and so uh, it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun uh, sort of creating that pathway, which, you know, set certain time frames and charged the DMV to create, you know, regulations and requirements for the initial testing phase of the technology on California roads and highways, and then set the marker for ultimate, you know, rules and requirements for them to be deployed uh, to consumers uh, statewide. Uh, why we should do it? Uh, well, California is obviously the place for a lot of the innovation happening, number one. And we knew that if we can uh, stay in a leadership position of uh, enabling the technology to evolve and come to consumers, then not only would we see the, the, the road, the highway safety benefits of it here first and, and in larger numbers, but the economic upside too. The, the R&D investment, the, the, the deployment, the jobs created, uh, and the ripple effects in the marketplace. So that's kind of just a, a general overview of how I came uh, to the issue. And here we are uh, five years later on the verge, quite possibly within the year, if we get a few more things right, of seeing it commercially available uh, here in the state of California. So I'm excited. One of those opportunities where you had a legislative idea once upon a time and you hope that someday, at some point, it might make an impact. Well, here we are on the verge of it being a reality in California. So I hope that tees up uh, my part of the conversation and contribution tonight. But thank you for having me. I'm wearing my ring still just as proof of if any of you don't believe, if any of you don't believe that elected officials can come from MIT. So thank you. Everybody, um, wow! It's it's such an honor to uh, to be here. So thanks to Jake and all the MIT alums. I understand this is the most active um, chapter of, of all the MIT alum network. So that's that's wonderful. And to be here um, to be here at Park is is pretty special as well. Um, I went to school prior to my MIT experience. I went to school at Stanford, and and it was wonderful to come back here. Uh, to the Bay Area and join Google's efforts on self-driving cars. It was, it was a pretty cool and pretty special thing for me. Um, as we were chatting and getting ready for this, we were talking a little bit about the etymology of the name Waymo. And while I can't give you the, all the details on that, because it's a bit of messy, bit of messy uh, sausage making, um, Tamara uh, or Jake, one of you guys asked, what do you call yourselves? Um, because if, if you know Googlers, like that's the word that we, we call ourselves if we work at Google. And new Googlers are called Nooglers. Um, we have a name for ourselves at Waymo, though, in keeping with that tradition. And we actually have a couple of Waymonauts here. Could the, <laughs> could the Waymonauts wave or, or say hi? How many of you are there? So we have three Waymonauts. Thank you guys for... Uh, for coming. The, the other thing that, that's special about this night for me, I gotta tell you, is I'm pretty sure no one has ever paid money to hear anything that I had to say. So <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm gonna disappoint you, but it, it, feels, it feels pretty special. It's also great to share the stage with, with Secretary Padilla. Like he was there at Ground Zero um, back in 2012. And to get myself ready for tonight, I went back and watched the YouTube, another Google property, uh, video. <laughs> Of, of Secretary Padilla uh, with Sergey Brin um, getting ready to launch this, this legislation, um, which has now set the pathway for, for all of our good work. So thank you so much uh, for getting that pathway started for us. Um, so, so why are we here? Why, why am I here? I wanted to share uh, a little bit of a, a personal story uh, with you. Um, so I, I, I've got this mom who's, who's pretty special. She's, she's an older lady. She's actually 97. Um, and, and she's still this robust uh, and very active woman. Uh, some of the Waymanots have, have met her because she came to our Mountain View campus uh, last year. And um, she came not with the intent of setting the record for the oldest human in a self-driving car, but she did, she did get that record. <laughs> and you know, she's, she's a pretty extraordinary person, so much so that um, Andy Verily, who runs, or um, Andy Conrad, who runs the Verily Life Sciences Company, um, when he saw my mom uh, in the vivacity that's so evident in her being, he said, we need to get her DNA, John. We need to do a blood test because she's something special. Um, but as special as she is, she walks a mile every day. She reads a book every day. Um, she, she plays Scrabble on her iPad and beats geniuses from around the world. Um, she decided she self-selected out of driving because she didn't think she was up for the task. Uh, so part of my reason for inviting her up from Southern California was to put her in a self-driving car 
um, and see how she reacted. Um, so part of it was a little bit of a science experiment. I wanted to see how my dear old mom um, would, would handle being in a self-driving car and, and what she would say. And the most amazing thing was she was wonderful. She was great. She was relaxed. And after maybe a minute of anxiety, Johnny, is this thing really going to work? Um, you know, she just became her normal, natural self. And she turned to me, and we had a nice chat. And, and it was brilliant, and it was wonderful. Um, it is sort of um, exemplary of, of many, many different experiences like that one that I've had um, in the couple of years or so that I've, that I've been working on this project with this wonderful team. Um, the technology works. The technology's there. And the technology is ready to provide a really important social benefit. Um, let's talk about some of those, right? And I know a lot of you guys, you guys know these benefits, but like, when you really think about them, you have to ask yourself, like, why have we been okay for so long um, with a transportation system, the, the automobile, the personally owned automobile, that is responsible for about 1.25 million deaths a year? Like, it's an amazing number. It's an astonishing number, right, Alex? I mean, but, but we put up with it. Um, it's an extraordinary social tax. To put it in terms of aviation, it's like a 737 with 140 souls on it falling from the sky every hour of every day the whole year. Like, if that happened in aviation, we would say, no, stop, that's not okay. Um, but for the most part, we put up with it. We, we put up with it, and I, I, don't, I don't know why. And I spent, I spent a couple of decades working at great companies like Ford um, and Hyundai, and we were working very hard to slow down the carnage. Like, trust me, the, the auto industry is so dedicated to fix this. Um, and you see it in the, in the technologies that are in the car, the, the passive technologies like airbags. Most cars now have eight to ten airbags in them. Um, and the active, um, the active safety elements, the driver assist systems that are in cars right now. And what have all of those systems done for us? Last year, highway fatalities in the U.S. went up 7%. So what the heck? We went up 7%. So what's the problem? What's the problem we need to solve? Alex said it. It's human error. It's like, I like to say, um, humans can be really good drivers. We can be. Like, we can be awesome drivers. The flaws were human. Um, and we're so easily distracted by all the extraordinary technologies that we're developing right here in Silicon Valley um, that it's hard for us to stay focused on the task. Um, and, and so our approach at Google um, had been, prior to becoming Waymo, what's the best way to solve this problem? And we looked at it in many different ways. Um, one of our first products was something a lot like um, Autopilot, um, offered by, by some automakers today. Um, so back in 2012, we had this, we had this system. We we're really proud of it. We've been at work for, for three years um, trying to solve self-driving. Um, we thought that we would put Googlers in cars, our Lexus RXs, um, equipped with LiDAR and radar and cameras. Um, and those cars were capable of driving uh, from a freeway entrance ramp to a freeway um, exit ramp. And they were really, really good at that. This is back in 2012. So we recruited about 100 Googlers, um, and we gave them very careful and very precise instructions. Um, you must pay attention when you're driving in these cars. But we want you to use them in your daily lives. We want you to drive to work in them. Uh, we want you to take them to lunch. We want you to enjoy them on the weekends, uh, but only engage this, this technology on the highways. Um, and oh, by the way, we have a camera in the car. And we're going to be watching you, and you better be paying attention. You don't have to keep your hands on the wheel, but you need to keep your eyes on the road. And we're going to run this, this demonstration for about a year. Turns out, we shut it down after about a month. And what did we find? Humans, <laughs> fallible humans, began to trust the technology too much. So like my mom became very comfortable in our fully self-driving car, which she should have been, um, this technology, which is more akin to L2, it should not have been so comfortable. And that's the conundrum with really good L2 technology. And I'm not sure we can solve it. Because the better we make L2, the more relaxed the human becomes behind the wheel. And they do what we saw in our little experiment. They take their eyes off the road. 
They reach behind them and get something out of their backpack. Sometimes they close their eyes. We were horrified by this, like absolutely horrified. And so we shut it down. And we realized the only way to really robustly solve this problem was to take the human completely out of the loop. That's the only way we're going to do it. And that's how we started to tackle the program um, and the whole project and that solve from that day forward. Um, and it's an interesting parallel to lean production. For those of you who, who, are, who are students of lean production, um, one of the key organizing principles of lean production is you take out the buffers. You take out the repair areas. You take out all of those things that cause those um, further ahead in the process who are sending things downstream. You remove those things so that everyone knows this has to be perfect. This has to work every time. Right? Um, for a team that's developing an L2 system, they always know they have the driver as the repair area, the person who can take over if they need to. So the system doesn't have to be perfect. It can be okay. It can be pretty good. Um, but it doesn't have to be perfect because there's a human there and we're telling the human, pay attention. The only problem with that logic is that humans can't pay attention all the time in situations like that. They just can't. Contrast that to the approach that we took back in 2012, which was, we don't trust you. We know you're not going to pay attention, so we're not going to ask you to. And it meant our whole team had to design a very lean system that was extremely robust and had lots of redundancies built in, but it was a system that didn't need to depend in any way on the human. Um, and that's how we've gotten to this point today. And, and we've been working on this for such a long time. And as Alex said, we're, we're, we're getting very, very close. So where are we now? Um, we announced a couple of weeks ago um, something called the Early Writer Program in Phoenix. Um, so in Phoenix, um, we'll be learning from real users on how they want to interact with self-driving technology. So we've got our spiffy new Chrysler Pacifica plug-in hybrid vehicles. They're great for this purpose. It's the world's only hybrid minivan. There really aren't any others to choose from. Plug-in hybrid minivan. It has power sliding doors, which is great for a use case like this. Um, and we asked a couple of weeks ago uh, the good citizens of Phoenix to raise their hand if they wanted to be a part of designing the future. And if they would mind, um, helping us develop uh, the human interfaces that we need to understand well with self-driving vehicles. We've been blown away, by the way, by the response to that. I mean, so many people want to help. It's indicative of, of the market response I think this technology will have. And we're going to learn so much um, from that time in Phoenix and from having real folks in the back of those minivans experiencing that. They're going to help us take it to the next level. Um, so. That's sort of where we are today um, at Waymo. I'm looking forward to, um, to sharing with you guys some more of our, uh, of our technology. And um, Jake, I think we might be ready to move on to, to part two. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. thanks, everybody. Thanks.